want to begin by acknowledging that it's, it's quite a privilege to be before you tonight. Certainly for me, it represents the, the culmination of quite a bit of work. And, and so I'm excited to uh, share with you tonight about the Lifestyle Medicine Clinic and the, and the hard work that's uh, went into developing it. And I want to thank you for pausing from your busy lives and, and spending this hour um, together with me. And, and, and I hope you will leave uh, with some additional information uh, different from when you uh, came in the door tonight. Tonight, I will consider it a success if we all leave, we all leave with these um, understandings. Uh, defining what the standard American lifestyle is comprised of and the link between this lifestyle and disease, why conventional medicine is not the best medicine for this type of illness, to celebrate that there is a solution, and that solution is lifestyle medicine, and to understand the key concepts of lifestyle medicine. Lifestyle medicine is using lifestyle habits to stop, reverse, cure, and prevent disease. Some other terms you're going to hear me use tonight, and I thought it very appropriate to define these, the standard American lifestyle. So this is the set of habits by which uh, is very common uh, for those living in this country. And you'll see slides noted standard American diet and fitness. And again, these are the typical habits um, for diet or fitness or sleep that are common to those living in this country. An acute medical illness is a sudden onset illness that has generally a very rapid uh, presence to its uh, uh, process, typically more severe in nature and an end point to it. Whereas a chronic medical illness is one that is more insidious in onset, more progressive, more long lasting. And finally, lifestyle-induced medical illnesses are those illnesses that have at their root cause uh, an abnormality to the lifestyle habits. The history of lifestyle medicine dates back just a mere 2,500 years ago to that of Hippocrates. And really, he coined it best. Let food be thy medicine and thy medicine be food. And of course, today, there's never a more germane time for that quote. The the term lifestyle medicine, though, was first used in the 1990s. The first textbook came out around 2000. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine was formed in 2008. And the first training programs to train health professionals appeared after 2011. So as you can tell, it's a relatively new specialty in medicine. My interest really good dates back to your the early 2000s uh, when I read the book Fast Food Nation. And this was really a sentinel event for me. It really outlined the link between the fast food diet and the American uh, lifestyle habits and sort of the consequences of that combination. And I began to recognize the link between healthy lifestyle habits and longevity as a practicing internist. And likewise, when lifestyle habits were not so good, what happened? And the, the culmination of a bunch of events led me to develop a, um, um, a, a plan to formalize my training in lifestyle medicine. And I, I started that process about a year ago. And then through the partnership of Holland Hospital, developed the Lifestyle Medicine Clinic, which began seeing patients uh, at the start of this year. So I think this picture describes the American lifestyle better than any text I could give you. And you can just imagine you know, this young woman who may be a little underslept, maybe a little overworked, overstressed, maybe a little sedentary because of the tasks that she has at hand, maybe a little too much time in front of the screen, and not really giving her body the best nutrition. And what is the consequence of that? It's really characterized on this slide. And you can see on the left side, these are the top causes of death that go on the death certificate. And you can see heart disease and cancer and stroke make up the top three. And really, these have been the top causes of death for a prolonged period of time. But the actual causes of death are noted on the right-hand slide. 
And, and these are the more relevant things. These are the things that lead to what goes on the death certificate. And you can see tobacco use continues to be one of the main causes of death, as is diet and exercise abnormalities, alcohol, microbial agents, which is interesting because that would have been a leading cause, you know, pre-1950s with the advent of penicillin, now becomes a much lesser common cause of death. And so the bottom line is, it's really bad habits that determine and give you the greatest risk of death. And so we're going to define some of these uh, habits and categories. And, fo and so to begin, we'll start with the standard American diet. And as you can see here, the majority of that two-thirds is composed of, of processed foods, fats, sugars, another quarter of um, animal product, meat, dairy, eggs, and only about 10% healthy, whole, real foods that have the medicine that Hippocrates was talking about in it to help stop and reverse and prevent and cure disease. Some additional statistics. Uh, Americans spend 10% of their disposable income on fast food. An average person consumes 130 pounds of sugar a year. And more than one in three are obese. The standard American diet emphasizes an overconsumption of processed food, of meat, dairy, and eggs, and an underconsumption of, of whole foods, whole grains, fiber, fruit, vegetables, and water. An underconsumption of, again, these medicines that Hippocrates was making reference to, the vitamins, the minerals, the antioxidants, anti-inflammatory, and other micronutrients. And the result of this is a lack of disease-preventing molecules and an over-representation of disease-causing compounds. Things like oxidants and free radicals, inflammatory agents, carcinogens and mutagens. The bottom line is this makes our bodies sad. They don't work optimally. It makes them sick. Couple this with the standard American fitness. Sedentary lifestyles have become very commonplace in our society. Three out of four do not get enough physical activity. And this inactivity causes a lot of disease, as you can see characterized here. Inactive persons consume more than $1,500 per year uh, than their counterparts that are more active. We're underslept. We've become um, standard and routine in this. Well, the average American does sleep less than seven hours per night, which is the definition for short sleep. One out of three have uh, less than seven hours. Uh, one out of five have less than six hours. And one out of four adults have a sleep disruptive uh, disorder. Short sleep and disrupted sleep cause disease, and they do this in a variety of ways. Uh, higher nighttime cortisol and reduced insulin sensitivity leads to higher glucose and higher risk of diabetes. Lower daytime leptin levels and higher intake of carbohydrates lead to higher weight and obesity. And elevated sympathetic tones leads to higher blood pressure and risk for cardiovascular diseases. In addition, short sleep and disrupted sleep cause less slow wave and REM sleep. These leads to impaired learning and memory and emotional distress as well as mood disorders. <clears throat> Immune suppression uh, leads to higher rates of infection and increased cancer-causing compounds and inability to perform DNA repair. One of the vital things that occurs when you sleep appropriately leads to higher rates of cancer. We lead very stressful lives. And we can all identify with these uh, slides. Two out of three experience <coughs> chronic stress. And this may take on recognizable forms, but also unrecognizable forms. Stress may manifest as poor sleep, depression and anxiety, but may also present as chest pain, headache, irritable bowel, skin disorder, and autoimmune problems. 
We as Americans are exposed to a variety of pollutants and chemicals in this country. The average American is exposed to 300 chemicals a day. Let that number sink in. These may come by environmental pollutants. They may come by home care products, environmental uh, uh, products, uh, things that you put on your skin or use in your shower. One out of five use tobacco products. One out of 13 uh, use alcohol in excess. Many of these chemicals are known endocrine disruptors, respiratory irritants, DNA changers, carcinogens, and mutagens. Remember, at our basis, we're biochemistry. And so all of these chemicals affect our biochemistry. So it's no wonder that these things impair our well-being. And so taken at its whole, the standard American lifestyle is, an, is a disease-causing machine. And it causes biochemical catastrophes, metabolic derangements, DNA disorders, oxidative stress, and inflammation. And that causes your organs not to work well. And non-well-working organs create high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high weight, high sugars, sleep apnea, coronary artery disease, peripheral arterial diseases. And sick organs lead to failing diagnoses, liver failure, kidney failure, neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's and dementia, as well as events like heart attacks and strokes. I akin the standard American lifestyle to like hitting your thumb with a hammer every day and then wondering why your thumb doesn't feel right or work normally. And if you hit your thumb long enough and hard enough, bad things generally happen. Now, cue the slide conventional medicine approach. So for most of these problems, we rely on the conventional medicine approach. And certainly the ability to stent a clogged artery, to bypass an obstruction, to take out tumors, to give chemotherapy have resulted in an element of longevity of increased life expectancy. For acute healthcare crises, conventional medicine is still the best medicine. But acute healthcare crises only consume about 20% of our total healthcare cost. So what about the other 80%? And while it is true that we are living longer, are we really living healthier? The other 80% of healthcare costs is attributed to chronic medical illness. That's the stuff that happens before the acute stuff. And the conventional approach applied to this type of illness is problematic for many reasons. First of all, it's very pharmaceutical heavy. And I've never had a patient once come in to tell me, doctor, I am so glad you gave me that medicine. I feel so much better on that medicine and I have no qualms with being on that medicine. It really has resulted in that concept of a pill for every ill. I kind of akin conventional medicine in my previous analogy to like exchanging out a heavy hammer for a lighter hammer. And then still wondering why hitting your thumb with a lighter hammer, still your thumb doesn't feel well. And nor, nor does it work well. And that's because it just doesn't allow the body or the thumb to heal. It's not treating the underlying cause. It's only masking the symptom, or rather addressing the symptom. That's where lifestyle medicine really shines. Lifestyle medicine takes the hammer out of the hand and allows the thumb to heal, or in this case, the body. Healthy medicine Healthy lifestyle medicine focuses on these habits. Healthy eating habits, healthy fitness habits, healthy sleep, healthy mindfulness, and intentional chemical reduction. And so we're going to talk about these individually and try to create a construct for what those healthy habits look like. Healthy eating consists of eating whole foods. And I heard this once said about whole foods. Nothing bad added and nothing good removed. 
And the best foods, of course, come from plants. They're rich in vitamins and minerals. They have naturally occurring antioxidants, anti-inflammatory and other micronutrients in them. They do not cause, they do not contain disease-causing compounds. They're nutrient-dense and calorically light, so they help manage weight. They consist of fruits and vegetables and legumes, whole grains, nuts, and seeds. And if I had a nickel for every time I was asked this question, I could probably retire a year earlier. Believe it or not, you can get protein from plants. In fact, you can get even better protein from plants. And this is a food pyramid from a healthy whole foods plant diet. And you can see the basis of that pyramid consists of fruits and vegetables. And also represented there are healthy whole grains and legumes and nuts and seeds. And sort of pictorial examples of those. How effective is this diet in preventing disease? This is an interesting slide. It shows in red the percent of deaths that occur from heart disease and stroke. And in green, the amount of the diet from those corresponding countries that consist of whole plant foods. And so what you will quickly notice is that those countries that eat the most, or the least rather, amount of whole plants have the greatest amount of heart disease. And those countries, on the other hand, that eat the most plants have the least amount of deaths related to heart disease and cancer. And this slide is an interesting one, too, from the Journal of American, Modi, uh, American Medical Association, a preeminent uh, medicine journal. And what it shows is if you take 3% of your diet uh, and move, in this case, processed meat out of your diet, just 3%, or un unprocessed red meat, or poultry, or fish, or egg, or dairy, you can see a protective event. So 45% would be the line over here. So about maybe 30% less chance of dying from any cause of death by simply reducing by 3% the amount of processed red meat in your diet. And again, you can see this recapitulated for all animal sources of meat. Eggs, interestingly, having the second highest uh, uh, risk to all cause of death. And then we can break that out and look at the risk of cardiovascular diseases, cancer, and other illnesses. And you can see how removing a little bit of animal products protects against death. Plant-based diets have been shown to reverse atherosclerosis. They have been shown to reduce the risk of breast, prostate, colon, and other cancers. They have been shown to reverse diabetes. They have been shown to reduce the rate of osteoporosis and hip fractures. They have been shown to reduce the risk of kidney stones, macular degeneration. Three additional servings of fruits and vegetables per day decrease the risk of stroke by 22% and they can improve or eliminate autoimmune diseases. I'm sometimes asked about various dietary habits, including diets that you may be familiar with. And so we'll talk about a couple of these. The ketogenic diet. So with what I've shared with you already, you can probably anticipate that I'm not in support of this diet. And the reason being that it's a diet that really is heavily weighted toward fat. Um, not that there isn't any benefit from fat, but most of the fat in the ketogenic diet is sourced, of course, from uh, animal product. You know, certainly bacon is not um, what I would uh, rely on for health and wellness. And then you have the um, paleo diet. You know, I, I can tell you that um, the reason why the paleo diet was helpful was because of this. You know, we don't live today like they did a few thousand years ago. And so if, if you're going to be a paleo diet follower, you, you should hunt and, and gather your own food. And, and, and that additional activity uh, to do so uh, will, will probably work out okay for you. But that's not how most paleo uh, uh, folks uh, live. And having meat as the basis of that dietary pattern will, will probably not have the um, intended result. And what about the Whole30 diet? 
you know, Whole30 approved here on the package of bacon. Again, probably not um, the, the diet that's going to result in the least amount of disease. Now, do some of these diets uh, fare you better off than the standard American lifestyle? Yeah, they, they might. I'm, it, it might be like, again, exchanging a 20-pound hammer for a 17-pound hammer. It might be a little bit better, but it's nowhere near a disease protective diet. The bottom line is, is I wouldn't encourage you to pursue fad diets. Uh, they're short lived. They're not going to bring you to the place of wellness that you want to go. So what do I recommend? And some of you may um, be familiar with the term flexitarian. I, I kind of readapted that to the Murfitarian diet. And, and uh, you know, I think this would be a good target for most anyway. Uh, you know, it acknowledges that still the best source of food comes from whole plants and really sets out as its goal to still primarily eat whole plant foods as your main source of food. But the reality is, living in this society in 2018, it's difficult to fully avoid meat, dairy, and eggs. And so... For the occasional time when you want to partake in that, certainly making sure that that's responsibly sourced may not turn out so bad. And I have this saying, you know, what you do 90% of the time matters more than what you do 10% of the time. But I still think you should strive for perfection. I think it's important to commit to a healthier you. And in doing so, uh, I think you should also gain the support of your household, clean out unhealthy food, be responsible for your diet. In other words, don't determine the second most important determiner to whether you um, uh, die or not from one of the top 15 causes of death to anybody other than yourself. So don't rely on restaurants for that purpose. Don't rely on a significant other uh, exclusively. Drink water often. And coffee, tea, plant source milks, these would be alternative sources of beverage. Eat three meals a day. Consume at least one cup of fresh fruit or vegetable with each meal. One cup of legume per day would do us all well. It would probably lower our, chance, uh, our uh, uh, colon cancer rates by 50% uh, countrywide if we all did this. Uh, I would encourage 30 grams of, of whole plant fiber per day. Uh, my wife and I have some interesting conversations, and one conversation we had on the way back um, from dropping our, parent, or our children off at their grandparents, so undistracted time of conversation, not, not a commonality these days in our lives. We debated this. If you could only tell somebody one piece of advice with regards to nutrition, what would it be? And, and that was uh, my statement. Eat, eat 30 grams of whole food plant fiber a day. Uh, probably more good you could do for yourself than that than anything else. Consume whole grains, nuts, seeds daily. Um, there's this concept of, you know, and again, if we go back to our analogy of the, the thumb and the hammer, when you've been living in the standard American lifestyle, with the standard American lifestyle habits, your body is sick, your organs are ill, they need respite, they need to recover. And so taking six weeks to kind of reset that and allow those organs to heal makes the body more resilient for those occasions that you deviate from that less than perfect diet. And so I would recommend periods of time, maybe two, three times a year, where you give your body that reset and try to be as strict of a whole plant food eater as possible. And again, when you're looking at meat, dairy, and eggs, trying to responsibly source them so they don't contain additional harmful chemicals, antibiotics and hormones and other products. So what does healthy fitness look like? These are my kiddos. And so I was trying to find a picture that would be relevant for um, this time of the year, but... I know 60 degree weather outside and no snow um, makes this picture a little less germane, but that was us just, believe it or not, about one week ago, so, so that it's amazing what a little time does. 
So physical activity. There's different components to, to fitness, and I want to kind of define some of these terms. Physical activity is any bodily movement that produces some degree of energy requirement above baseline. And this consists of your activities of daily life and work and function. It's not being sedentary, and this is a life improving um, process. Uh, the goal is to do this 10 minutes every um, awake hours. This is different though than exercise. Exercise is something more and above and beyond that. It's a, a purposeful and intentional activity that uh, is rhythmic in nature and is sustained for a period of time and associated with the contraction of large muscle masses in your body. It maintains an elevated heart rate too uh, for a period of time. Walking may qualify, but does not necessarily. If you track the amount of time it takes you to walk for a mile, it would require about a 12 minute mile or thereabouts to really qualify for most people for that to be counted as an aerobic exercise. The goal is 150 minutes per week. Um, and, and this is kind of an interesting story. That 150 minutes a week is designated that way because that can be uh, spread out over any number of days a week you would wish it to be. So you can be the weekend warrior. You can exercise 150 minutes in one day and you get the same protection as if you spread that out over every day of the week. And up to 40% reduction in all causes of death by having the appropriate aerobic physical activity. 10 to 20% additional reduction in death beyond those who are already active in their lifestyle. This adds two to five years to your life. And you can see here a slide that shows the decreasing all-cause mortality with increasing number of minutes per week of exercise. It's interesting because most studies in conventional medicine look at, okay, what's the chance of us improving, um, you know, maybe the A1C by 1%. No studies look at what's the chance of decreasing the risk of dying because they make such little changes. This is the power of lifestyle. What about strength training? This looks to improve muscular tone and ability. We recommend two sessions, 30 minutes per week in duration for that. And you can see it reduces the risk of injury and fatigue. And then there's flexibility, which improves the ability of the joints to be fully active and helps reduce pain symptoms. What about healthy sleep? The optimal sleep is known, and that's seven to eight hours a night of uninterrupted sleep. The deepest and most restorative sleep comes the first half of the night. And during the ensuing half of the night, it's normal for uh, you to have brief awakenings after 90 minute sleep cycles. Sleep hygiene, we know, improves sleep quality and quantity in ways that it, uh, avoid the adversity of more risky things like sleeping pills. Sleeping medicines are dangerous. To help maintain sleep, and healthy sleep in particular, it's a good idea to maintain an appropriate amount of daylight sun exposure. To maintain daytime physical activity, avoid naps, use the bed for sleep and other activities alone, <laughs> establish a regular schedule for bedtime and awake time, and try not to deviate from that by more than an hour. By the way, uh, for those who may be frantically trying to write some of these, uh, this uh, discussion will be available to you online, and probably the slides I'll try to make available to you on the Lifestyle Medicine website too, which we'll get to in a moment. And so don't feel that if you don't get the chance to write it all right now, you won't have the chance to see this again. I probably should have started with that, but uh, avoid caffeine eight hours prior to bedtime. This was an interesting thing. One of the more interesting things I learned in 2017, alcohol affects your sleep patterns for three hours per drink that you have. So if you have two drinks, six hours before it doesn't affect your sleep. Avoid screens one hour prior to bed and then creating a bedtime routine that helps you unwind 
and prepares the body for sleep is an important thing. Increasing peripheral cutaneous circulation, that induces the body to go to sleep. A warm bath might do that. If not asleep within 20 to 30 minutes, get out of bed. Find a quiet place, a non-distracting place to meditate or read under natural light, not with a screen, though. And then repeat as often as necessary uh, until you fall asleep. Recognize that how you spend your time with regard to uh, caffeine and alcohol, carbohydrate, sort of the light you're exposed to, these things all affect sleep. Healthy, healthy sleep reduces the risk of obesity, high blood pressure, cholesterol, cardiovascular disease, cognitive disorders, mood disorders, infection, and cancer. So the next time you think about shortchanging your sleep, Remember these things. Sleep improves quality of life, memory, emotional well-being, and sexual performance. Mindfulness is a topic that you may have heard of before. And this is an important way to keep our minds connected well to our body's physiology. And I like this slide. I borrowed it from a colleague, and it says, watch your thoughts because they become your words. Watch your words because they become your actions. Watch your actions because they become your habits. Watch your habits because they become your character. And watch your character because it becomes your destiny. Between the stimulus, and trust me, as that picture showed earlier, we're all bombarded with a variety of stimuli. Between that stimulus and the response, there is a space. And in that space lies the mindfulness solution. And that can be cultivated by a mindfulness stress reduction program. It teaches meditation. And it helps us to make our bodies more tolerant and resilient to negative stress. It cultivates a being fully present on purpose without judging and allows us to evaluate relationships between our mind and body. And this allows us to harness powerful inner resources that promote healing. It cultivates the ability to experience each moment to its fullest, no matter how much difficulty, with serenity and clarity. It is both a practice of mind and a state of being. The practice is learned from a mindfulness expert. The goal is to spend about 30 minutes in this type of activity a day. And the benefit is that it facilitates that peace of mind and that inner resilience. And the, life's, and the last set of lifestyle habits we will explore tonight together is the idea of reducing harmful chemicals from your lifestyle. The bottom line is we want to avoid harmful chemicals. There are lots of different ways to do this. Some of that just involves not doing it. For example, avoiding tobacco. Again, this would be one of those things where avoidance of tobacco, and, and probably many of you here tonight are not smokers, but avoiding tobacco is probably the biggest determiner of what ultimately happens to you. Heavy alcohol, and I've defined it there on the slide, there are a lot of chemicals on foods, and so by choosing organic sources, you minimize those. And then by lessening the amount of uh, other chemicals we come into contact with. Uh, for those trying to manicure lawns, some of these other products uh, may be good to avoid. There's also the concept of ditching and switching harmful products. In other words, this is the idea of exchanging out something that is more harmful for something that is less harmful. And there are some wonderful apps that help facilitate this. The types of products, though, include home care products and personal care products. And a couple apps that I made reference to, the Environmental Working Group has one, and then there is Think Dirty. And the way those work are you can barcode scan your products, see how they rate out, and then find healthier alternatives that do the same job. I want to leave you tonight with one final uh, couple slides. 
And this has to do with the blue zones. I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, the blue zones, but, but these are some different areas around the, the globe that have cultures of people that live routinely above the mark of 100 years. And we have learned a lot of things from these cultures of people that if you follow these, these important things, downshifting the stress of your life, living with purpose, having a plant-forward diet, having a drink, actually, but not in excess, uh, making your family a top priority, following the what you do 90% of the time matters than 10%, uh, eating when your body is 80% full, moving about frequently, finding the right tribe of people to spend community with, and belonging to a faith these things offer powerful protection against disease and illness. Anybody want to take a stab as to how old that gentleman is? He's well above 100. And if I could look like that when I was above 100, I would count my lucky stars. And you can see, I would argue, he's above 100 because he's not sedentary. He's not like what some of those previous slides look like. Here's a woman, again, well above 100 from a slightly different culture, and she is gathering her food. This woman is from California. She's above 100. I can't do that. <laughs> and again, these folks are all above 100, too, and they're showing the, the uh, presence of community. I thank you for joining me tonight, and I hope that by having a little more of an intentional and purposeful delve into the concept of lifestyle medicine, you will be equipped to make some changes to your lifestyles that could have a dramatic effect on what ultimately happens to you. I also want to make mention that I alluded to this earlier. We have now opened the Lifestyle Medicine Clinic uh, through Holland Hospital. This meets patients at the Center for Good Health, which is at 8th and Waverly. And you may call at any time now for an appointment. And I'll explain a little bit about what that care looks like. You will be scheduled for an initial consultation. And, and at that visit, you will meet with myself. And we will outline some of these things that we've outlined here, as well as an assessment of where you're currently at with your lifestyle habits. And most importantly, what you're hoping to achieve by making changes to your lifestyle. I work alongside of an interdisciplinary team, and I, I see some of them are here tonight, and I thank them for their attendance. We have experts in fitness and nutrition and sleep hygiene and mindfulness training and how to reduce harmful chemicals. And we have health coaching available as well. And so at times, I might want you to also work with some of those team members or all of those team members to help uh, establish healthy sets of lifestyle habits. And so with that, uh, I believe I will stop. I will actually, before I do that, uh, there is the Lifestyle Medicine website. Uh, it may be found by going to the Lakeshore Health Partners website and, and you can navigate there. You can click the uh, services, uh, and you will see Lifestyle Medicine is one of those selections. And if you click on that, you'll get a little more information about what Lifestyle Medicine therapy consists of, as well as how to call and inquire about more information or schedule an appointment.